Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Virtual European Experiences. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kathy Wood. I'm the founder of European Experiences, along with my husband, Charlie. And we are really enjoying the opportunity to connect with our friends in, in Europe and to uh, have a bit of a travel experience in a year that we can't travel. So today, we're going to be traveling to the English countryside and specifically to the lovely village of Chipping Camden in the northern Cotswolds. And we'll be joined in a minute by our friend Carol Jackson from her historic home on the High Street in Chippewa Camden. And I'll tell you more about Carol here in a minute. We have 67 people registered for today uh, from a variety of places, Canada, New Zealand, France, the UK, and the USA. Uh, some of you have been on our Cotswolds trip, so you spent some time in Chipping Camden. Um, others of you hope to go in the future, and I think we even have a few people who live there in the area. But I thought I knew Chipping Camden, but when Carol and I did our run through a week or two ago, I learned a lot that I didn't know before. Just a few things about how the program will work. Um, we are continuing to get better at Zoom, but we're coordinating again between two countries and we may fumble. So just bear with us. It's intended to be a little bit informal. Now, this is a webinar. You won't be visible. You'll just see the two of us and our visual aids. Um, I'll be back at the end of Carol's talk to help with a question and answer session and to share some wrap up information. Now, if you have a question at any time, or a comment, you can type it in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try at the end to respond to as many of the questions as we have time for. If we don't get to your question, um, I will write you back later. At the end of the session, a short survey will pop up. We'd love your feedback. If you have time to complete it um, at the end of the program, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow and you'll get a link to the same survey. Just don't answer it twice, we would ask. There's not a charge for any of these sessions, but we do want to recognize the time and effort of our presenters. So if you enjoy the session and you can make a small donation, that would be wonderful. Some people have already sent checks to cover several sessions and that works. Um, we'd suggest 10 to $20 US um, and 100% of the donations for today will go to Carol. And at the end of the program, I'll show the link to our website with the payment options. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Carol, if you want to come back on. Um, Carol is originally from Wiltshire, from near Bath, just below the southern end of the Cotswolds, but she's lived with her husband Jeffrey in Chipping Camden for 32 years, and she's taken a very strong interest in the history of this special village. Now, I was wondering, getting ready for today, uh, how long I had known Carol. I went back and looked at some old pictures, and Carol, interesting, I have a picture of you leading a walking tour with our very first um, Cotswolds experience group back in 2010. So. Um, we've been friends for about 10 years, and over the years, Carol's has led many walking tours for our groups and many other visitors as well in her role as a voluntary Cotswolds warden. Last year, she also led a special tour for our return to the Cotswolds group to the nearby village of Broad Camden. And Charlie and I have really enjoyed spending time with Carol and Jeffrey. So we were delighted she was open to joining us today to share a very different sort of tour of Chipping Camden. And with that, I'm going to turn off my video and turn it over to Carol. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, you're right. I've been here 32 years and I, we moved into this very old house that I live in. And it was that house that got me interested in history. And I joined the local history society to start researching about the house. Um, oh, is that Kathy there? Yes. Uh, right, so I'm uh, still working on researching and today is a bit less formal, uh, more um, less history, a bit more casual. Now I'm going to start off and share my screen and let's hope it works. Okay, well hello everyone. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about celebrities in Camden. And by this, I mean famous people or people who may have been artists or writers or musicians, uh, personalities. And before we start, I must uh, remind you, of course, what Camden is famous for. It's arts and crafts heritage and its connection with Charles Ashby and his Guild of Handicraft, which came to Camden in 1902 and set up workshops in an old silk mill. They were making silver, jewelry, stone carving, metalwork, 
building houses. Uh, much of their work is in museums now. You can often see it on the Antiques Roadshow. Uh, and um, one of the people, I, I, I'm not going to talk to you about Ashby because he's a whole lecture in himself, but I did want to bring this man to your attention. Alec Miller, he was one of the Guild's key stonemasons and carvers. And he came to Camden as a young man and stayed 37 years here, working all the time. He was a very sensitive um, man uh, and we loved his work here. This, for instance, is in Cheltenham Museum in Limewood. His work is all over England in war memorials, um, uh, in churches, in private collection. Oh, this is uh, in a church in Cumberland. It's a little kneeler. This is in a church in Lancashire, lovely carving in Carn stone. And uh, many are in private houses and commissions. And uh, in 1939, he actually emigrated to the USA to live in California. He, uh, in the 1920s, he'd been over quite a lot of times to America uh, to do work, and he decided to go there in the end. He was, in fact, a, pe a, a pacifist and left before the war started. And in the USA, you can see his work in Bryn Mawr College for Girls in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania in Claremont School in California, in Carmel Episcopal Church and in a Monterey Girls School at Santa Catarina and also in Canada at Montreal I believe the Anglican Cathedral has his work and there's another chap I'm not going to talk about Fred Griggs and he had um, uh, he was a big etcher and artist he's very important in Camden's history because of his conservation work uh, but one of the key things um, is that he built a big house here, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about later. Uh, he's another person who's a lecturer all on his own. So I'm going to start with this little arrow each time, um, and I'm going to try and show you where you are. So this is the map of Camden, and the arrow there is um, at the Ligon Arms, which I believe is your hotel when you stay here mostly. So now I'm going to take you to Westington, this area here. It's very pretty with thatched cottages and gardens, stone roofs. And this area is called Heavenly Corner. And it seems to have had a whole coterie of celebrities early in the 1900s. They must have all known each other and moved in the same circles. And it's centered around these two houses, Woodruff House and Abbotsbury. This is the way up to Abbotsbury at the side and the front door of Abbotsbury. And this is an old photograph of the back of Abbotsbury from 1902. And it was this chap, Joseph Morat, who seems to have been the catalyst although I've not found out why he came to live in Camden in the first instance. So why was he a celebrity? He wrote music. He lived here with his wife and three daughters, and he wrote a series, one of the things was a series of nursery rhyme books uh, where he arranged the music and the pictures and the music were drawn by Paul Woodruff, who was in fact his brother-in-law. Uh, Joseph had married Paul's sister. And if you can see on your screens a little PW at the bottom of the page of music, PW, Paul Woodruff. You will often find on Paul's work a little PW, something like that. Now, this contemporary drawing of children in hoods with snow on the ground is in a book called Charles a child in Arcadia uh, by Harry Osborne. And he recalled how in 1902, dressed in red hooded capes and carrying lanterns, they went carol singing in Camden at Christmas. 
and he describes calling at Mr. Morat's house and singing to him his own carol. The snow lay on the ground. And this music again was illustrated by Paul Woodruff. And Paul, who was an artist, an illustrator, and then also a stained glass artist, he lived at Woodruff, what's called Woodruff House now. This is the front door. And this is as it was. And behind this house in a little studio, originally a cottage, he had his workshop where he made and uh, all the stained glass. There was lots of collaboration between Paul Woodruff and Morat, as you can see here from As You Like It, Shakespeare's As You Like It, he wrote some music and the music was designed by Paul. And here's the music. And now to Paul's stained glass. Uh, this is probably what he is most well known for. These are from Chipping Camden Church, Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, he had a, a very great skill in making the glass feel like velvet, little details at the feet of people. There's often little daisies. And you see this here in the left hand picture. There's a pea with what look, well, is a little flower. It's actually a woodruff flower. So in some of his stained glass windows, you can see that little pea and the woodruff flower. Uh, this, these are some of his works in local houses. This is Mary Mary Quite Contrary with uh, cockle shells and silver bells. This is Little Miss Muffet, and this is in a chapel, a private chapel somewhere. And here is an early window at Caister on Sea in Norfolk. That's right on the far side of England, on the far right of England. And uh, this is from 1901, commemorating a lifeboat disaster. And from his middle period, this is 1920s, uh, this lovely Christmas window in Surrey in Leatherhead. And some of these um, pictures, the heads of these people were used on our Christmas stamps in England in 1992. And another window in that same church at Leatherhead is this uh, based on um, a Holman Hunt draw, pa painting, which is in St Paul's Cathedral in London. It's called The Light of the World. And again, see the little detail at the feet. And these are from, the next lot are from uh, his later work at Cardiff Castle. And he was very good at heraldry, at researching things. Look, you can see the daisies again at the feet. I think he's absolutely brilliant. And why I'm showing you these later ones is because in 1909, he got the commission to draw uh, and to sort of design and make 14 windows for the Lady Chapel in St. Patrick's Cathedral, Fifth Avenue, New York. And he was making those 14 windows all the time that he had been doing these. The commission was actually finished in the 1930s. It had been interrupted by the First World War because the ships could not take them across the Atlantic uh, to erect them. And he'd lost a lot of his staff because they had to go to war. But the commission was finished finally and installed in 1934. And I'm afraid when I went to New York, I went to um, St. Patrick's to see these windows, but it was terrible. I couldn't see them at all because they were, it was dark, uh, because there was no sunlight, because of skyscrapers. Uh, so if any of you got pictures or can get there and see them and take photos for me, I'd really like them. Thank you. So this is Cardiff Castle, which was finished in 1937. Now, there's another chap who was friends with this uh, group. He'd started out by doing some work with Morat as an illustration, an uh, illustrator for Morat. Um, and then he'd got friendly with the Ashbys 
In fact, uh, there's a 50 year correspondence with Janet Ashby in one of the uh, colleges in Cambridge. And he, uh, or incidentally, he was the brother of um, A. E. Houseman, the, uh, who wrote the uh, Shropshire Lad. And um, so it, Lawrence became friends with everyone in Camden. He wrote a play called Bethlehem, and this is from another book, 1903. Christmas is good at Camden with big fires and bracing talk. Time to pause. Gerald and Gwendolyn Bishop came down. Gordon Craig's production of Bethlehem in London was the talking point for Lawrence Hausman wrote the play. Gwendolyn played Virgin Mary and the music was written by Joseph Morat who lives in Camden. And here is part of the play and here is the music and guess what? Designed by Paul Woodruff and if you look hard you might find a little P at the bottom of the left picture and another W in the bottom of the right picture beautiful drawings and the music and again another one from the same play and another person at this time just a year or so later who came to stay was Harley Granville Barker he was a major reformer of the Edwardian stage at this time working with the Royal Court Theatre he was a playwright a critic an actor a director and he was writing a play with Lawrence uh, Hausman, uh, it was a Piero fantasy called Prunella or Love in a Dutch Garden. And the garden was supposed to be Morat's garden at Abbotsbury. And here are some photos of the garden as it exists today. And I reckon these trees and things must have been here for several years maybe when they were here in 1904. And another person who came at this time, he came in 1903, first of all, got friendly with them all, came and stayed many times afterwards. He wanted to come and live here. Uh, he had, in fact, just come back in 1903. He'd just come back from um, a trip to America and he just published his first book of poems called Saltwater Ballads. This one has uh, got the famous sea fever poem in it. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I must go down to the seas again to the lonely sea and the sky and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer me by or steer her by. Um, anyway he was uh, quite well known as a poet by then. He'd just taken a post for an art exhibition in Wolverhampton at the time. Uh, and he had plans, he just got married, he got plans of coming to live in Camden for good. But he somehow never did. He did become Poet Laureate in 1930. Oh, this is one of the songs and the poems he wrote of while he was here in Camden. And now I'm going to take you to the High Street to the Cotswold House. This is um, a hotel now. This is how it looks today. And you can stay there. Um, and this man, Charles Aubrey Smith, is supposed to have been here from the age of one. His father became a, was a doctor and came to work here in 1864, but he left uh, when Aubrey was seven. So I don't think we can take any credit for his upbringing. However, this man uh, went on to learn to play cricket. He played cricket uh, for, South Af for uh, Cambridge University, then went to South Africa to prospect for gold and played test cricket for England there in 1889. He returned to become a stockbroker, and it was when he was 50, over 50, by 1915, that he made his first cinema movie. He originally appeared in a number of silent movies, but um, I think it was after the advent of sound that he really found his position. And he used to get roles as the tall, stereotypical Englishman the military officer, ministers of the cloth. And I 
remember him as the grandfather of Laurie, the boy next door in Little Women. That was one of his last films. He was a major Hollywood actor and in 1932 founded the Hollywood Cricket Club. And further down the road, here's the, uh, here's the um, Cotswold House, further down the road at Darby's House, John Gilgood, actor, theatre director, lived for several years in the 1950s. This house was rented by the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in Stratford. You may know that we're only about 10 miles away from Stratford. And so when uh, the, uh, actors came to do the season, they were found properties to live in. And they used to like to come and stay in Camden. And one of the key people was this John Gilgood. Often our local ladies became housekeepers or cleaners for the actors. And therefore there were always tales to tell of their time. And until last year, this gentleman, Bob Wilbur, jazz musician, saxophonist and clarinetist. He lived at the other end of the high street. He's lived there since 1984 with his wife. Uh, he's a famous um, musician, was taught by Sidney Bechet in the 1940s, has performed all over the world with many famous musicians, had several bands, Wilbur and the Wildcats, the Soprano Summit, the Bechet Legacy, Bob Wilbur's Big Band, and he did the music for the Cotton Club film. And coming up to more modern days, Johnny Depp hid out incognito in the flat in this old grammar school building while he was filming in the area in 2006 and seven. And at the other end of the high street, Stamford House. This house was rented for several years in the summer by a doctor and Mrs. John Carroll Perkins from Seattle. Mrs. Perkins was a keen, widely recognized gardener, a garden lecturer, a fellow of the Royal Horticultural Society. And this is one of her hand colored slides that are now kept at the RHS. Uh, she also got an award from the Garden Club of America and she'd been coming to the UK since 1911 on and off and because she was particularly interested in gardens and she used to organize group visits. So she stayed at Stamford House for these years in the 1930s and T.S. Eliot used to visit he came at least 13 times and he used to visit because Emily Hale was with them. Uh, Emily Hale was their niece, Mrs. Perkins's niece, but she was also having an affair with T.S. Eliot. And from 1936, Emily Hale was assistant professor of spoken English at Smith College. It was, uh, of course, T.S. Eliot, you must know, famous for The Wasteland, for Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, which is the basis for the Lloyd Webber musical Cats, and for Murder in the Cathedral, which he must have been doing, it, that's dated 1935, so he must have been doing that about the time when he was in Camden. And also he's famous for something called The Four Quartets. This is regarded as his masterpiece and he was awarded a Nobel Prize in, in literature for it in 1948. Um, the first, it, it consists of four long poems which were published separately. And the first one being called Burnt Norton and published in 1936. He was inspired to write this after on a walk with Emily, he strayed into a deserted, ruined garden with a burnt down house and an overgrown rose garden. The house was known as Burnt Norton because it had been burnt down in 1741 when it was owned by Sir William Kite. 
the poem is a bit difficult to understand. It's meditative, talking about time present and time past and so on. But it does mention looking down into the drained pool and uh, talks about the roses, I think, as well. At the other end of the high street, that, that was where Stamford House is. And at the other end, on a, a house called Davis House, there is this little insignificant brown plaque. And this commemorates this man called Ernest Wilson, who was born in Camden in 1876. And he was interested in plants and took expeditions in the 1900s to China, Japan, Korea, and Formosa. He was working for Vetch and Kew Gardens for the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. He took photographs and his important collection is at the Arnold Arboretum now. He introduced about 1200 species of trees and shrubs and collected over 100,000 herbarium species. He's, uh, he found the Chinese gooseberry or the kiwi fruit and something called the handkerchief tree. He uh, is a very famous plant hunter born in Chipping Camden. He in fact ended up as the keeper at the Arnold Arboretum and had plans to retire to his beloved Gloucestershire but sadly he and his wife were both tragically killed in a car accident in the USA in 1930 when he was still only 54 and before he'd retired. And further down the road again, Park Road this is now, is Julia's Cottage. And it was used from 1982 for a period by other actors working the nine month season at the Shakespeare Theatre. And I wonder if you know this chap, Anthony Sher. He came from South Africa in the late 1960s and is a major English or, or actor here in England. He won a Laurence Olivier Award in 1984 for this role he was playing Richard III at Stratford. And there's a book he wrote about this year when he was staying in Julia's cottage. For instance, for instance, 6th of May, 1984, I've fallen in love with the 18th century cottage Jim and I have in Camden, Julia's Cottage. And my favorite part of the day is the drive into Stratford. As you come out of Camden, you go over the brow of the hill. It's so beautiful. And in June, to the King's Arms for lunch, but I'm terribly restless. I keep thinking back to a similar lunch here two years ago with Gambon before King Lear opened. Jim senses my tension and suggests a long walk. It's baking hot again. We set off along the side of Dover's Hill. And now further up this road here, Hoo Lane, another little cottage. Incidentally, it's a holiday let now where the author Graham Greene lived with his wife in the 1930s, he wrote his bestseller, Stamble Train, here, and other books, in fact. And he wrote, My Nerves Are in Pieces. We have found a thatch cottage with a small garden and orchard up a muddy lane on the edge of Chipping Camden. It was to rent for a pound a week, and we moved a few belongings there, including a new bought Pekingese. There was no electric light and the Aladdin lamps smoked if we left them for a few minutes alone. We were a scared couple that first night with no sound of accustomed traffic, only a hooting owl. And now we move to the other end of the high street, to the ruins of Camden House. Does anyone know this man? Salman Rushdie. After his first novel, The Satanic Verses of 1988, he was the center of a major controversy, provoking co protests from Muslims. Death threats were made against him, including a fatwa calling for his assassination. As a result, he was put in police protection. He went into hiding. 
one of the places he hid out for three months was this old banqueting house built in 1615. No Wi-Fi, no TV, simply furnished, limited heating. You can rent it and stay there. It's run by the Landmark Trust. It's a good spot because you can see the approach all around over the Conigree or the Rabbit Warren. We're told he never went out. And just between the church and the house, on the other side of the church, is another uh, spot, which is owned by Kazuo Ishugaru. And he is a Japanese novelist, one of the most celebrated contemporary fiction authors in the English-speaking world, having received four Man Booker Prize nominations and winning the 1989 award for his Remains of the Day. Uh, we often see him walking around, coming to concerts and things. He's got his hideaway just near the church in that little one. And now I'm going to go to something called Griggs Close uh, in the back ends. I, I don't know, Jeffrey, you'll have to tell me. And uh, is Frank Brangwyn. Uh, there's a connection with Frank Brangwyn. He was a major painter, printmaker and muralist. He bought this house. Now, this is the house that Griggs built for himself. And when he died in 1938, his wife and family were still living here, but he left terrible debts because of the building of this house. And um, I think uh, Brangwyn knew Griggs and therefore bought the house. He said that Mrs. Griggs could stay in it and he wanted the dining room or the big living room to store his paintings. He is well known for his extraordinary art. In 1925, he'd got a commission to draw, to paint uh, a series of panels for the Royal Gallery at the House of Lords and they were to represent the dominions and parts of the British Empire. But the House of Lords never erected them. I don't think they liked them, but they were erected in Swansea in a special hall that was built. And now I'm going to take you to Broad Camden, a little hamlet just down the road from Camden, to Mary's Acre, where here we have um, lots of uh, more theatre people who stayed. Paul Robeson stayed. Um, and a little old lady told me that she was sitting up here uh, when she was about 20 and the church service was coming out of the uh, Sunday evening, church service was coming out of the uh, church. And this man came and said, may I sit with you? And he sang all the songs from the hymns from the service and that was Paul Robeson. Sam Wanamaker was also staying in Broad Camden when he was playing Iago. Laurence Olivier, well known for all his roles, with his wife was in Broad Camden when they were at Stratford. And at Maidenwell Manor, which is well hidden away, you can't see that, Richard Todd, uh, an English actor, I don't know whether you know him, famous for uh, The Longest Day, The Dam Busters, uh, some Disney films, all kind, massive career. He lived here and owned it for 10 years. One minute. And now we have Ananda Kumaraswamy at the Norman Chapel with his wife. That's how it looks today, the Norman Chapel. He was a Singhalese man, very... Uh, intelligent and bright, interest in Indian art, um, and bought Essex House Press printing machinery, major book on Singhalese art. In the end, he and Ethel, his wife, separated, and he went on to become curator of the Indian art uh, section at the Boston Museum. He took all the things he'd collected um, and was stored in the Norman Chapel. He took them all to the museum where his collection is now. Ethel went on to become a famous, very famous spinner, dyer and weavers um, pioneer. She married and became Ethel Mary, moving to Ditchling, known as the mother of hand weaving. And 
the last of all, we've got Julian Lloyd Webber. You might know him, brother of Andrew Lloyd Webber. He um, lives in Broad Camden at a house called Toad Hall, head of the Birmingham Conservatoire now. He's been here for several years. And I'm finishing with George Trevelyan, the famous historian who visited Camden several times in the 1920s writing in his social history which was published in 19 in 1944 of Camden he wrote the most beautiful village street now left in the island and here I leave you with some pictures of Camden from the old days that high street you can see your ligon arms in these pictures so Christmas caroling in Ch Chibbing Um Yes, uh, although it's a little bit more organised these days. We do it at the churches, of course. There are often carol services at churches, but we do have groups of people that go out from house to house, and uh, often it's for charity raising. Yes, we do. Or, or we go to shopping centres like to Stratford-upon-Avon and, and do it in the open air. I did it last year in Stratford in the rain. So Carol, is um, also you're in... Um... A, gr a singing group there too because I heard you once um, in a concert at the church. Oh yes! Yeah. Yes. yes, I sing with several choirs as well. Yeah, she's a person of many, many talents and I, <laughs> what's impressed me with Chip and Camden is um, what a vibrant life there is for the people that live there. So. Yes, indeed. We're very busy all the time and this lockdown uh, period um, has well, it's been quite devastating for us because uh, we've lost our music festival, we've lost all the concerts we'd have, we're not able to rehearse and sing, uh, we haven't had our history meetings, and again, I haven't been able to take any guided walks to you, before you. Well, we were sorry not to be there this year. Um, I have a question from Lily, and she has asked, um, when did the word chipping get added to Camden? Because you've referred to it as Camden. Yes, well, Camden was the first name. Camden meaning camp, a settlement, a campus from the Latin, a settlement in a dean in the valley. And then when we got a charter in the 1100s from the king, which enabled us to have a market um, in the square, and then the, the um, town was actually built around this market and this charter, uh, we got the name Chipping. Chipping comes from an old English word, seeping, C-E-P-I-N-G, which means cheapening. So when you had a market, you got things cheaper. Oh. So we're a chipping, a market a settlement in a valley. Um, another question. Do any, from Susan, do any of the artists and writers so on participate in the local art scenes, the people that are still living? Um, I've obviously, um, yeah. Lloyd Webber does. Lloyd Webber does, yes. Um, we see him out and about, and he is patron of our music, part of our music festival. And Ishiguro has been at um, the literary festival that we have here doing mm. things. Mm. And also, uh, Bob Wilbur, until he died, was very active in the town. I've been to loads of dues with him and uh, socially with him as well. Yes. And my husband paints. And Jeffrey says he paints. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we've, got, we've got lots of artists here and lots of activity and craft. So, is that some of Jeffrey's work behind you there? Oh, gosh. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question from Jeannie. She says, um, What was the big draw for all these luminaries to live in Camden? Well, that, this is curious it's a very pretty place Depression. how did i come here you have to say i mean i was really attracted by it when we first saw it um i think uh, the morat man brought a lot of people for some reason because they all knew each other they were all collaborating together and ashby brought a lot of people as well from london that he knew um and now beyond that Depression. why did they come Inexpensive. Well, no, I don't know. I don't know because it was nice, I think. I mean, why did M M Trevelyan think it was the best high street in all England in 1944, even though we might have been depressed? You'll have to come and see. 
for those of you that are on Facebook, our friend George, who's also a College Falls Warden, he runs a Facebook page um, of old pictures of Chipping Camden, which is extremely interesting. So. Yes, yes. Oh, here, George has just put a note in. He, oh. Here, George has said, uh, Jeremy Spencer lives in Box Cottage in Broad Yes, yes uh, he's right. Famous as a young actor who appeared in a number of programs. So That's George, right, but he's uh, a very old man now. I saw him the other day, too. Yeah. Um, Carol, would you tell everybody a little bit about your house there in Tripping Camden? Yes. Uh, well, when we first came, we knew nothing about the history of it. We knew it was old, but we didn't know how old. And um, uh, on the day that we moved in, the gentleman who gave us the key said, here, you better have this. This is a book, something to do with the house. And uh, when I started to find out about it, we discovered that it was the building that Ashby had bought um, in uh, 1902, when he came here, Ashby had used it as his um, architectural practice and his office with his secretary and his drawing office and so on here because he was designing houses. And he also converted a barn at the back, a malt barn, which was a ruin. He converted it into a lecture hall with uh, 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 craft rooms underneath mm -hmm. and he ran his school of arts and crafts here mm -hmm. from 1904 so that was what we were learning about it the building itself goes back to well before 1600 it, it, it's on one of these burgage plots that would have come about when uh, when we got this ch market charter and the town was being planned in the 11, 12, 1300s. So it's very old from the, the roots are from that sort of 1300 period with um, developments over the years. And the latest development was with Ashby in the 1904 period. So one last question that's a good tie on from Norma. She asked, are the homes, um, I think from the pictures that you have shown us, are the homes and the architecture typical of the UK in general or just of this area? No, not typical of the UK at all. They are very special to this area. Uh, this area is what we call, um, a, what is it? Area. An area of outstanding natural beauty. And the natural beauty is based on the oolitic limestone that is on the whole of the area of the Cotswolds. Uh, it's, and it's because you've got this stone underground that the houses are built out of stone, not really out of wood or okay. certainly not out of brick because brick came much later. So all of the churches and villages and um, uh, buildings and, uh, you know, in the countryside are built out of stone and it is pretty unique to this Cotswold area or areas that have oolitic limestone. I mean, interestingly, if you were to drive just 30 minutes north to Stratford-upon-Avon, the architecture and the building material is totally different. Correct. And just 30 minutes drive. So I want to thank Carol for her, her talk with us today. And I have just a few things to share with you in closing. Um, I'd like to tell you first a little bit about the trips that we offer in the Cotswolds. Um, we offer a couple variations, um, a seven night trip, and we stay at a lovely small family owned inn on the high street, the Ligon Arms. Um, it's the oldest coaching inn in Chipping Camden and it's been in, in the same family for four generations. Um, our premier trip is the Cotswolds Experience. Um, it's kind of an introductory trip to the area. Um, we have um, in the past offered the Cotswolds Garden Experience which has more of an emphasis on the beautiful gardens in the area. And then last year, for the first time, we offered Return to the Cotswolds. It was a trip designed for people that had already been there with us once and loved the area and wanted to return to experience more. Um, next year, we'll be offering, we hope, the Cotswolds experience. Um, this would be um, in July. And also uh, a second trip that will be really a combination of Return to the Cotswolds and the Cotswolds garden experience. Um, we're gonna visit some very unique gardens on that trip, but it'll um, focus on much more than just gardens. And we're talking about uh, potentially offering a Cotswolds walking week um, in 2022. We'll be announcing that um, 
after the first of the year. The walking in this area is just absolutely phenomenal. And all the trips will involve visits to beautiful stone villages, um, as you saw in Chipping Camden, uh, the stately homes and castles, beautiful gardens, the lovely countryside. Um, the food in that area is just outstanding. Um, it's a very rural area with a lot of agriculture. And so a lot of the food comes from um, very nearby and um, the very delicious food of, of all types um, and a lot more. Um, including a walking tour of Chippy Camden with Carol um, and some of the other Cotswold wardens that we've come to know over the years. So it is a lovely trip, beautiful area. And as you could tell today, so, so very interesting. And you can learn more on our website or please drop me an email and I'll be happy to talk with you. Um, now, we're asking for these programs. Um, our presenters like Carol are putting in a lot of time getting ready for the program. And if you can, we'd like to offer you the opportunity to make a donation. 100% uh, will go to the presenter. Um, we suggest a small donation, 10 to $20. And we offer several different ways that you could pay that. A few people have sent us checks to cover a number of sessions and that's um, a great uh, approach. We also can take payment through Venmo or PayPal. Um, and then if you're international, uh, transfer-wise, we find is a good way to make some international contributions. Um, and on our website, www.european-experiences forward slash payments, if you go um, to that page on our website, you'll find um, links for Venmo and PayPal, which makes it very easy. Um, I want to tell you also a little bit about upcoming programs. Uh, and we, we hope we'll avoid any future technical issues. We have six more sessions planned for this year um, and we've adopted Thursdays um, Eastern time in the United States or Canada, two o'clock PM. Um, all sessions will be one hour maximum. And the session next week will be an overview of our Luberon experience week in Provence. And I'll be presenting that and also involving a couple of people who have been on that trip in the past. Um, in the future, we have sessions planned. Um, Jennifer will be doing a session on uh, French cheese. Uh, Ariana will do a session on the olive harvest in Chianti. Tommaso from Puglia will offer an introduction to this beautiful area in Southern Italy. And then we're doing two programs uh, related to the holiday season. Um, so we'd love to have you join us. Um, you can go to our website to uh, register for any of these programs. If you can't come to the program live, um, go ahead and register and you'll get a recording afterwards. So again, thanks to Carol for um, a very, very interesting program. And thanks to all of you for being with us today.